Hello, this is Artur Ortiz. In the previous video, we described how sola scriptura leads to circular reasoning and that this in turn shows why we need an authority outside of the Bible. Please check out that video to learn more about why this is the case. In this video, we will look into another problem of sola scriptura. The second problem with sola scriptura is that it is not biblical. If a Christian of good faith wants to practice Christianity, then one ought to see what specifically the Bible says. But as we will see, the Bible itself condemns any notion of sola scriptura. I will show how there are no scriptural verses that speak of the Bible alone, but rather point to some in the church endowed with special authority, and specifically that there are other ways apart from mere writing, such as oral tradition, in which Christian teachings are passed down. I will first start by stating that 2 Timothy 3.15 does not use the words alone or that the Bible is sufficient. It only says that all scripture is inspired by God, divinely inspired, which it is, and that it is profitable for our salvation, which it also is and which Catholics don't deny. Think about the case of a house builder. One could be said to profit from having a hammer and nails. However, no one would say, that these tools are of themselves sufficient for building a house. One would also need, amongst many other things, the knowledge of building the house, his knowledge of construction, and other various tools necessary for the building of the said house. The same thing could be applied to an architect who needs not only a blueprint for the design of the house, but the necessary math, such as geometry, in addition to his knowledge of engineering. But we also run into a lexicological problem with the following verse, namely that the Greek text of Timothy 3.16 states Pasagraphe Theopneustis. In plain English, this translates as each, every, or all scripture inspired by God. In other words, if Paul was talking about the sufficiency of scripture, then he would be designating each book of scripture as sufficient in of itself, namely every, each, or all. After all, the Greek word Biblia means the books, which is clearly not what Paul is talking about. This then takes us to what we described in the previous video. How do we know which books belong in the Bible? Is there such a thing as an apostolic tradition guided by the Holy Spirit and in which a central figure such as the Pope has supreme authority? After, it was not until 100 AD in which the last text of the New Testament was written, and not until 397 in which an official canon of the Bible was put in place. So part 1, Divine Revelation and the Word of God. Scripture furthermore shows that preaching and not writing was the primary means in which the people of God taught others. In the Old Testament, for example, the prophet Jeremiah, like many of the other prophets, are said to preach to the people. Jeremiah 3 2 furthermore states that while 23 years had passed, the word of our Lord had come to him. And I have spoken persistently to you, but you have not listened. This text shows that the transmission of God's word can be either oral or written. God can communicate with us in either way. This is precisely what St. Paul states in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, in which he states that we have received the word of God which they had heard from us, and which they accepted not as the word of men, but as what it really is, namely the word of God which is at work in new believers. Similarly, St. Paul states in 2 Thessalonians 2.15 to stand firm and hold to the traditions or teachings, paradoxes, which you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by letter. In other words, St. Paul is telling us that the passing of Christian truth or teaching, or literally traditions, that divine revelation comes to us both by writing and or by oral preaching. Part 2. Jesus and Apostles Accept Non-Scriptural Tradition Many who read between the lines in regards to scripture realize that Jesus and Apostles themselves also quoted non-scriptural oral traditions. For one thing, regarding the prophecy that Christ should be called a Nazarene cannot be found in the Old Testament. On the contrary, it is said to have been spoken by the prophets. 
as stated in Matthew 2.23. Similarly, Jesus teaches that the scribes and Pharisees have a legitimate binding authority, which he calls Moses' see in Matthew 2.23. Yet such terminology is not found in scripture. It is rather an old tradition which then made its way into the Mishnah, which describes a sort of teaching succession beginning with Moses. Furthermore, in 1 Corinthians 10, St. Paul tells us about a rock that followed the Jews through the wilderness in Sinai. Yet this is not found in scripture, but in rabbinic tradition. Lastly, regarding James and Jambres, who are said to have opposed Moses in 2 Timothy 3.8, are not found in the Old Testament regarding the related passage of Exodus 7.8. One final example is in regard to Christ's answer to the devil when he is tempted in the desert, as Matthew recalls. In this chapter, Jesus rebukes the devil by reminding him of the passage, Man shall live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Matthew 4 Furthermore and lastly, John tells us in the last verse of chapter 20 of his gospel, namely that Jesus did many other things signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. John 20 30 Part 3 The Holy Spirit promised to all the authoritative nature of the church. We will now look at what scripture says regarding the Protestant idea in defending sola scriptura, namely that at least all essential knowledge can be known even by the most ignorant simply by a genuine prayer of the heart of being enlightened by the Holy Spirit in understanding scripture. One scriptural verse that is often quoted to support this view is John 16.13 which states the following, namely that the Holy Spirit will guide you into all the truth and in which he will speak not on his own authority but whatsoever he hears he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. But can we really grant that even the most ignorant merely by genuine prayer and reading of the scripture can inerrant come to essential doctrines and the like? One can easily see in scripture that there is nowhere in the New Testament or in scripture in general which claims that the Spirit was promised and given to all as a means of understanding all essential truths of Christianity. Rather, it's through the primacy of the apostles and the Pope in which Jesus for one tells Peter in Matthew 16 that upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus furthermore gives Peter the keys of the kingdom with the authority of binding and loosing. Similarly, in conjunction with this passage, we see in Isaiah 22 the same symbol of authority vested in Eliakim. It is in the context of magisterial authority by which we ought to read the text of John 14.16, namely that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Truth. Jesus was specifically talking to his now 11 disciples. Through scripture, we continue to see this notion of an authoritative church which is guided by the apostles and in which has a central apostle, namely Peter, as head of the church. This can most easily be seen in Acts 15, the Council of Jerusalem, the first one in the history of the Christian church. In this council, we see that the church confronting the doctrinal difficulties concerning the circumcision of the Gentiles, namely the heresy of the group known as the Judaizers. We see this authority in Acts 15 when we read that Paul and Barnabas and some others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem in which they would gather with the apostles and elders in order to solve this matter. We then see the apostles, the precursors to the bishops and elders, presbyters and priests. It is an apostle James who makes the judgment against the Judaizers in Acts 15.19. Lastly, it is Peter, the universal bishop of the church, the pope, the chief apostle, who rises and speaks in behalf of all the apostles in Acts 15.7-11 and gives the final verdict. It should lastly be mentioned that scripture constantly talks about the necessity of interpretation by the church of scripture. This is especially true in those areas in scripture which are very complex and difficult to understand. For example, Peter in one of the last verses of his second epistles 2, 3, 16 tells us that in Paul's writings there are some things 
hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do with other scriptures. In other words, there are various areas in scripture that are very difficult to understand and which, if interpreted wrongly, could bring about their destruction such as through heresy or moral errors. Furthermore, in Acts 8, the deacon Philip encounters a eunuch from Ethiopia who is reading from the prophet Isaiah. Philip asks him if he knows what he is reading. The eunuch responds by saying, How can I unless someone guides me in Acts 8.31? Please stay tuned for our last installment in the series of Sola Scriptura in which we will go over the question of whether Sola Scriptura works from a practical perspective in regard to unity in doctrines and ecclesiality. Have a blessed day. God bless. <laughs>